In one of the experiments at Cambridge, the students drop spheres with different densities and diameters into tanks of oil with different viscosities. They then measure the terminal velocity of the spheres, and this allows the drag coefficient of the spheres to be calculated. One of these spheres drops very slowly, and one of these oils is very viscous. In this situation, the flow creeps around the sphere, and the Reynolds number, which is the ratio of inertial to viscous forces, is very, very small. This scenario, in which the viscous forces dominate, is known as creeping flow. This picture, which is taken from Van Dyck's album of fluid motion, shows the path lines in creeping flow. Now it looks a little bit like those that you get for inviscid flow, but it's important to point out that the velocity profile is very different. In creeping flow, the flow is like one big boundary layer. For example, at this point and at this point around the sphere, the azimuthal velocity, v theta, as a function of the radius r measured from the center of the sphere, looks like this. There is zero velocity on the surface of the sphere, and then the flow tends towards the free stream velocity v as r tends to infinity. At very low Reynolds number, the inertial forces are negligible compared with the viscous forces. If we take the Navier-Stokes equation, which is F equals ma written for a viscous fluid, I'll write as a equals 1 upon m times F. The acceleration is the material derivative of the velocity field, dv by dt. That can be written as partial dv by dt plus v dot grad v. And then the forces per unit volume come in two forms. One is the pressure forces, and the other is this, the viscous forces. If the inertial forces are very small, then this equation can be arranged into grad p is approximately equal to mu del squared v. And intriguingly, this equation can be solved analytically for a sphere. This is known as Stokes flow, and the radial velocity is given by this expression, and the azimuthal velocity is given by this expression. One can then integrate the shear stress around the surface of the sphere to find the viscous drag on the sphere, and it has a very simple expression, 6 pi mu rv, where r is the radius of the sphere. If we then work out the drag coefficient using pi r squared, the cross-sectional area of the sphere at its widest point, as the characteristic area, then we find that the drag coefficient is simply 24 divided by the Reynolds number, where the Reynolds number is defined as rho v d, the diameter of the sphere, divided by mu, the viscosity. And flows at low Reynolds number seem very strange to us, because we very rarely see them from day to day. A particularly curious effect is known as kinematic reversibility, which is that if an object does a symmetric motion, such as the flapping of the tail of a fish, it will simply return to its original position once it has completed one cycle. In order to move in a very viscous fluid, one has to break some symmetry. For example, a rotating corkscrew can rotate its way through a viscous fluid, and the symmetry that's broken is that the corkscrew has to wind either one way or the other. But that's not the topic of this chapter. What I want to do now is consider flows at a slightly higher Reynolds number than creeping flow. I shall call this fairly low Reynolds number, by which I mean the flow around the sphere at a Reynolds number of around 100. At this Reynolds number, the boundary layers separate. On the picture you can see flow separation here and here, and on my diagram they're shown here. Now the pressure along the back of this object is roughly the same as the pressure at the separation point, and this is lower than the corresponding pressure at the front of the sphere. And this gives a net force on the body from left to right in the direction of the flow. This is known as form drag. And if we plot the drag coefficient as a function of the Reynolds number for the flow around a sphere, and if we plot the line 24 divided by the Reynolds number, which is the contribution of viscous drag, then we see that the total drag is greater than 24 divided by Reynolds number, and the difference between the two is the contribution of the form drag. And note that the vertical axis is a log axis. On the left we see, therefore, that viscous drag dominates at low Reynolds number, while at higher Reynolds number we see that form drag dominates because the viscous drag becomes very small. As the Reynolds number increases, the form drag increases relative to the skin friction. Beyond a Reynolds number of around 1,000, the skin friction is negligible. Between a Reynolds number of 1,000 and 200,000, the point of separation remains very close to the equator. We can see this on the instantaneous image on the left at a Reynolds number of 15,000, but perhaps it's more clear in the time averaged image on the right, where here we can see the separation point here and the recirculation zone behind the sphere. 
And because the position of the separation point doesn't change much with Reynolds number, and because the pressure difference between one side and the other, delta P, scales with a half rho V squared, where V is the speed of the incoming flow, the drag coefficient in this range of Reynolds number stays approximately constant at around 0.4. And if we go back a page, you can see this region around here. But you can also see that something rather curious happens around here. The drag coefficient suddenly drops. For a smooth sphere, this is at a Reynolds number of around 200,000. And what's happening here is that the boundary layer becomes turbulent upstream of the equator. This increases the rate of streamwise momentum transfer from the free stream, and this causes the boundary layer to remain attached for longer, such that the separation point is quite far back towards the rear of the sphere. And this is seen perhaps more easily on the time averaged image on the right, in which one can see the separation point and the much smaller region of recirculating flow. And this is beneficial in two ways. Firstly, there is some pressure recovery in this region here, by which I mean that the pressure at the separation point is greater than the pressure at the equator. So the pressure along the back face of the sphere is larger than it was when the separation point was at the equator. And secondly, this lower pressure acts over a smaller region of the sphere. So not only is the pressure drop between the front and back of the sphere not as big, but it also acts over a smaller area. And these two effects combine to greatly reduce the form drag. If we go back to the diagram of drag coefficient versus Reynolds number, you see that the drop in form drag just here is quite large. And it's worth noting on this figure that the drop in CD due to the form drag is due to the turbulent boundaries layers remaining attached for longer. But what happens later at higher Reynolds number? Well, one finds that this drag goes back to around 0.4, as even the extra momentum transfer due to the turbulent boundary layers is no longer able to keep the flow attached around the back of the sphere. And one returns to the case in which the separation point is at the equator of the sphere.